Hey there. Um, so, somebody asked me to do a message on Esau forsaking his birthright. Um, I've done a few messages on this, uh, but it's been a little bit. And I mentioned it in the other message. Esau says in Hebrews, Let there be no profane person or fornicator um, who, like Esau, who for one bowl of porridge despised his birthright uh, and then he sought repentance and couldn't find it, meaning once Jacob swindled him out of it, it was Jacob's. Now the birthright is not salvation. In a way, salvation is tied up into the birthright, right? Because salvation makes us sons and heirs. Um, but if you were Esau and you didn't get the birthright, that didn't mean you weren't part of the blessing or whatever. It's just you had to acknowledge Jacob to get it. Just like Joseph, he was doubly, he got a portion way above everybody. And in order for his uh, family to enjoy what Jacob had entered, I'm sorry, Joseph had entered into, they had to be reconciled to him. You couldn't be at odds with Joseph. Um, or Abraham, he, he was blessed, right? Well, consider Lot. There was strife between the herdsmen of Lot and Abraham. And they decided to part ways. And Lot looked, Abraham was walking by faith and said, look, you can have whatever you want. And so Lot used his eyes to see the most pleasant thing and looked and went to Sodom. <laughs> um, but the Bible calls him righteous. Even though he departed from the source of blessing, which was Abraham, and ended up in a pretty low estate, he was saved. Righteous man. Peter calls him righteous. Um, despising your birthright is not necessarily being in unbelief and rejecting, you know, it's yours. Okay? To despise your birthright, it's yours. So it's your birthright. So, you don't lose your birthright. You can't lose your inheritance. Um, not in a rich house. <laughs> Even the long lost heir that you've never talked to, uh, a distance and sells from the family when you died of his name's on the will, he gets whatever's allotted to him. But Esau despising his birthright, the birthright, it's, I think it's just the birthright. It was really Jacob's in God's mind. Because Jacob knew, or God, God knew how things were going to go. Um, but that meant Esau was not considered the firstborn and the priv place of privilege, the place of honor. That's really what the firstborn or the birthright refers to. It's your place of honor. Uh, you know, the prodigal son is still the son, even when he doesn't have his robe and his ring on and he's in the pig slop doesn't change his position it changes his enjoyment of the position but still even more in Esau's time there was preference and certain allotments given with that particular blessing the birthright apparently only one person could have it and we know that ultimately the person who has it is Christ that's what we've been talking about is that Christ is the seed to whom all the promises are made. That's why sin can't disqualify anybody for an inheritance. Um, you know, Paul's argument in Galatians 3 is, look, the law can't disqualify. It came 400 years later. It can't dis disqualify the heirs. And by the way, you're not heirs because Christ is the seed to whom all the promises are made. The point is the law can't disqualify him. You're not qualified anyway. You don't get an inheritance. If you want to, if you want to have it by works, you don't get it. Um, but we were baptized into Christ and have put him on, and therefore are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Not because Abraham has many seeds, but because it's one seed, which is Christ. And being baptized into Him, we're reckoned as Him. We enjoy His position, and ultimately, this is the way it works with the birthright. You either 
are rightly related to the person who is who has it or you don't have anything so that's the position of lot uh, that's the position of Esau at least in enjoyment they didn't have um, the blessing that they would have had in their enjoyment and their experience if they had stayed if, if Esau hadn't been offended at Jacob and said, okay, you're the heir, I, I made the mistake, he could have still been blessed. Just enjoy it with Jacob. What would cause them to not, what would cause him to not enjoy it? Well, hatred, jealousy, envy, strife, hardness of heart. Now, it's interesting because in Hebrews, one of the things it says is, uh, you know, as the day approaches, you want to exhort one another as the day draws near to lest anyone seem to fall short of the great of grace of Christ and any root of bitterness spring up among you and by it many people be defiled and lest there be anyone who's like Esau profane fornicator despising the birthright and you know afterwards he couldn't get it back he is not talking about salvation He's talking about your relationship to your blessed position. And the temptation there uh, for the group was actually strife and bitterness among them. Due to, in part, the pressure of the persecution that they were facing. Um, the, it, you know, when you stand outside the camp, and you've left the institutional church and the institutional churches are all telling you you're just lazy and looking for a license to sin you've apostatized from Moses your family stops talking to you when when you are associated with a group of people that are all doing that and you're suffering for it it's actually tempting to blame the people around you it's easier to get offended you know you start to go, I'm identified with these people. And you start looking around and going, is it worth it? <laughs> and that's actually what was possibly could happen that he was warning about. He was actually talking about the temptation to be offended. Jay Esau was offended. Uh, he was a hunter. He came in after working to hunt and bring in, you know sustenance for the family. He was Isaac's favorite, too. Um, no, not Isaac. I'm sorry. He was... Yeah, Isaac's favorite. Um, but Jacob is kind of like Abel in that he doesn't really do anything that's perceived to be useful. All he likes is what is on God's heart. The difference between Abel and Jacob is that Jacob didn't know how to rest in what is his. And we don't have that sense from Abel. But Abel became a shepherd and Cain was mad. He came in from the field and tried to offer up his works and thought, probably thought Abel was lazy. Shepherding didn't mean anything because they didn't eat meat. Um, there was not, you know, okay, maybe you're all going to wear wool and that's why he's a shepherd. He was the first shepherd, and there's no reason other than offering the firstling of the flock uh, and the fat portion at the altar. And, and then God accepted him, and that really offended Cain, who was born first and would have thought he's the seed to, that the, is going to crush the seed of the serpent. You know, uh, he would have thought he's the Messiah, the promised one. And yet his offering was not accepted, and Abel's was, and he was furious. Well, there's something kind of similar going on with Esau. Uh, that he was offended by Jacob, and there was some sort of offense there. Um, when that bowl of porridge is a little significant. <laughs> you know, for Jacob to say, okay, give me your birthright, and I'll give you the bowl of porridge said a lot about what Jacob was interested in, which he's interested in the things of God, even though he's a swindler. And Esau, being willing to give it up, it says he despised it. Um, 
Now, I don't know if es Esau is saved because the Bible says Esau is Edom. And he went and lived in Mount Seir where there were Nephilim. Uh, he, and he, he was not godly. And there's a perpetual enmity between Edom and Jacob, Israel. Um, and if you just look it out through the Bible, clearly there's judgments on Edom and there's not a future reconciliation for Edom. And it says Esau is Edom. So that's really significant. But just wanting a bowl of porridge wouldn't have disqualified him for salvation. Root cause unbelief. That is what would be the issue, right? And why is that important? Because when we read these verses, we think it means if you sin, you could lose your salvation and never be able to repent and get it back. You just want that bowl of porridge. Okay, now again, why does it call him a fornicator? <coughs> because he didn't fornicate. It, despising the birthright and wanting a bowl of porridge, at least in our mind is not fornication. When he says fornication, we literally think fornication, you know? Um, and especially if you are, ha you have sexual sin problems, that can be a real stumbling block. It does not make sense for him to mention fornication there. It, contextually, there's no reason to, unless it's referring to something else. Um, okay. So there's a few things. Esau, I don't believe, is saved. Number one. Number two, but that's another discussion. It's because he doesn't believe the gospel. Number two, Esau uh, didn't necessarily have to be excluded from anything. All he had to do was acknowledge Jacob. And Jacob, when he receives the birthright, is standing in the place of Christ. Because that birthright is Christ's. Why? Because Christ is the seed to whom all the promises are made. He's the heir. Everybody before was just a steward passing that down uh, in the bloodline and, you know, the, preserving the lineage. But until the heir comes, the inheritance isn't realized. Uh, until there's a death of the testator, there's no testament. And Christ is the testator who died. And now there's a testament, a will in effect, and he's entered into the, his inheritance as the heir. But that birthright is his inheritance. So at any time, if you have been baptized into Christ and have put him on, you are reckoned as Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise, and you have what is yours coming to you. But are you enjoying it? And Hebrews is not about ultimate salvation. It's about present tense enjoyment. It's called entering rest. Rest is the enjoyment of inheritance. Rest is the inheritance. The rest, the good land, was called the rest for the people of God. And the uh, seventh day, which was also called the rest, was the day when God has ceased from all his works and you cease from yours, and then you're standing in the works that are finished from the foundation of the world. And by the way, that's what holiness is. The first mention of holy, sanctified and made it holy was that he sanctified the seventh day um, and made it holy and that day is the definition of holiness which is everything is provided for you, you're not required to do anything, touch the eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil though that's death in that day um, which is a prefigure for works righteousness but I don't have time to get into all that, uh but in Hebrews, rest, typified by the seventh day, typified by when God sees from all his works and you sees from your works and you're striving to earn anything, you enter rest of faith. And then the good land, which is the rest for the people of God, which Joshua, our Jesus, brings us into. Um, and then the holiest, which is access to God himself. That's the other type of rest, which it's actually God's rest because the holiest was where God had set his name as his resting place. And when we enter into rest and we have access to the holiest, we are in God's rest, which is his inheritance. We become his inheritance. You know, Ephesians says uh, that we, he prays that we'd have 
our eyes opened, the eyes of our spirit of wisdom and revelation, the eyes of your heart being light, that you may know what is the riches, uh, the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. God has an inheritance and it's called his rest. We're to enjoy his inheritance as co-heirs with God himself in Christ. Right? You've not received a spirit of bondage again into fear, but a spirit of sonship in which we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself witnesses with our spirit that we are sons of God and heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And who's Jesus Christ? God himself, who became a man to enter into as an inheritance called the birthright, everything that was his already, which is, and it's called the rest in Hebrews. Okay. The birthright is the rest. The birthright is the inheritance. The birthright is the enjoyment of the blessing, the enjoyment of the fellowship, the enjoyment of everything God has for us. Uh, it's the it's the title to it. And who has that title? Christ. Okay. And how did you get any relationship to that title? Through faith in him, you were baptized into him and have put him on. Um, okay, so... We're not talking about eternal salvation. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about a hardness of heart that causes you to despise the birthright uh, and not enjoy it. And on the one hand, he mentions a bowl of porridge. On the other hand, he mentions fornication and uncleanness, profane. Is he just talking about general sin? You can forfeit your enjoyment. It is true that while you're sinning, you're not enjoying. But this is something different because that's not the context of what he's talking about. He's not talking about sin in general. He's talking about going back to temple. And you're going back to temple because of an offended conscience um, due to the persecution from all the supposedly godly people who are telling you You've apostatized from Moses. You've disobeyed. You're not obeying the law. You're not obeying the Bible. You're not following our traditions. What are you doing out there? Uh, that's the sin from Hebrews 10 all the way to the end. The willful sin. What is the willful sin? Giving into all that pressure and going back to temple, tr counting the blood of Christ an unclean thing by which you were sanctified. So these are saved people. Uh, the blood of the covenant and trotting underfoot the son of God and putting him to an open shame and crucifying him again openly. That's what you're doing. If you go back to temple or dead works to try to satisfy your conscience. Now, what is the satisfaction of the conscience? Um, it's to give you rest. You know, when you are agitated in your conscience, you have no rest. And what you do is you seek ways to justify yourself. When people accuse you of things, you want to fight for yourself. Why? You say, no, I didn't do that. And you want to tell the other side of the story. I'm going to get some closure here and tell the other side of the story. Why do people want to do that? Why can't they just let it go? Well, because their conscience doesn't have any rest. Their conscience has been attacked. And there's a part of them that says, I got to get clear. And I'm willing to fight for it, you know. Okay, there's two ways to deal with the conscience, and Hebrews is about the conscience, the perfecting of the conscience. One is through your own works, you seek to satisfy the accusations and get out from under them so that you get rest from all the guilty feelings and the feeling of shame and the feeling of embarrassment and also the need to be right. There's a need to be justified, especially by men. It's interesting that the pastors love justification by men as a doctrine because they need to be vindicated before men and approved of men. It's really important to them. Um, there's something in us that goes, I need those people to know. I need my mother to know I'm a success and not a failure. I'm, you know, I'm 50 years old and she still thinks I'm an lo unemployed loser because I'm a musician. <laughs> in her mind, I'm an unemployed loser. And I, I wish I could make a million dollars and shower, you know. That is seeking to be justified, uh, which is what we've been talking about. Seeking peace for my conscience. Okay, now the, the, the peace in my conscience that I would get from that is temporary, fleeting, and guess what? It's not really legitimate. 
Um, and it's likened to a bowl of porridge. Despising what you really have in Christ for something so stupid and momentary. Just because you want, you, you know, he was hungry. He needed to satisfy his stomach. So he was willing to trade the whole birthright for that. And that's what it would be like to go back to temple. For me, that's what it would be like to go back to an institutional church for any reason other than wanting to because I felt called of God to do it. If I went just because I was finally sick and tired of my family telling me that they think I'm ungodly and they think I'm backslidden. Anytime my kid sins, you know, and he's got some behavior issues, it's because he's not going to church. It's because his dad won't, you know, take him to church. He's ungodly. <laughs> Um, there's a lot of pressure there and it, it would be a relief if I could just go back to church and, and shut all everybody's mouth right well that would not be a very satisfying relief and it would leave me bitter uh, and that bowl of porridge wouldn't have filled him much you know after after a couple hours he's hungry again and now he's lost everything and he's he was hit hardened his heart so he got so mad he couldn't repent from it. Well, it was too late anyway because Jacob had the blessing. He had to accept Jacob's position now. Uh, this is not possible for a believer, really, to have a permanent hardness of heart or something like that uh, because it's not possible for us to soften our heart either. We have a high priest who takes care of us. It's all dependent on him. My heart's not soft, he's got to intercede for me. And he's taking responsibility for me as the shepherd of the sheep. But, um, it is true though, if I seek to satisfy my conscience with uh, something other than faith in the blood of Christ, I said there was two ways to be satisfied or get to get that, to deal with the conscience. There's dead works, which is anything you do to try to deal with it apart from the blood of Christ. And then there's the blood of Christ and faith in the blood. And that way is legitimate because it brings you into rest. It brings you into the presence of God. And then he washes you. That's why we come to him with a heart and full assurance of faith, having our uh, bodies sprinkled with pure water and our hearts purged from an evil conscience. We need our hearts to be purged from an evil conscience. And an evil conscience is a conscience that's accusing you that causes you to be restless so that you seek to justify yourself either in front of men or before God or to yourself to get the guilties off. And he is likening those feelings of wanting to be vindicated and get stop being persecuted, stop being associated with these group of misfits out there uh, to a bowl of porridge. If you give in to the pressure for a bowl of porridge, what are you despising? This, you, it's all comes out of Hebrews 10. You trot underfoot the Son of God, count the blood by which you were sanctified in a common thing or an unclean thing, D insult the Spirit of grace, trample underfoot the Son of God, put him to an open shame, crucify him again openly. That's what it would be like for a believer after st going outside the camp and assembling with the rejected ones who have rejected religion in the, in, in the favor of Christ himself to go back. It's a renouncing of everything that you've gained, which is your birthright. It doesn't mean you lost it. It means you're not enjoying it and you're embarrassing yourself and you're embarrassing everybody else. <laughs> so the, um, the, the, let not the, the root of bitterness spring up and defile many there. It's talking in some sense about the relationships among the saints, you know, and Offenses that can come in that can cause you to give in to the pressure to satisfy. Now, why fornication and profane? You know, well, number one, because, well, really, I think the root of it is what the law represents, which is another husband. To a believer who's died with Christ, he's dead to the law. And that's the argument in Romans 7, um, that you know, as long as a woman is bound to her husband, she's bound to him by the law as long as he lives. But we were, we died to the law in the body of Christ that we may be joined to another and bear fruit to God. So it's not called adultery. If we, if we were married to Christ, it'd be called adultery if we were still married to the law. To go back to the law is a type of spiritual fornication. 
Um, and that, you know, there was a law in Leviticus that if a woman, you know, you said God doesn't recognize second marriages. That's not true because the law said if a woman had a second husband, she'd left her first husband and he gave her a bill of divorce and she went to the second. She was not allowed to go back to the first lest she defile the land. Now that had to do with the confusing birthright and inheritance and stuff because the land was related to who inherits what and who belongs to what tribe. If you've gone to another husband, you go back, you're defiling the land by confusing the lines of who gets what, the allotment. And guess what? The allotment was their rest. And what was rest? Rest is entering into God's rest, and it rep it's represented by the seventh day, as well as the good land, the, the allotted portion, and God himself. It's the day he called holy. So holiness is rest. And that's the point in Hebrews 2, is that there's restlessness, which is really related to a un a, an evil conscience, a restless conscience that causes you to do dead works that just manifest that the way into the holiest hasn't been made manifest to you and shows the futility of your situation and you defile yourself versus holiness, which is associated with rest. This is all the way through the scriptures. People don't know that rest is holiness. They think getting to work is holiness. No, holiness is rest. The law of first mention shows us that the first time God mentioned it was in the context of establishing the seventh day in the land that he'd given them the, where everything was provided and he finished all his works and then he declared that day holy. The Sabbath is very important to God. It's the most important commandment if you're under law, but the reality of the Sabbath is our faith in Christ and our enjoyment of what we have our enjoyment of the birthright, which is not ours, but his. If you, By the way, if you think it's your birthright, you're out of the rest. Because now you're going to try to work to maintain something that is not yours to begin with. You, and, and that is the actual root definition of seeking to be justified. Establish your own righteousness is to establish your own qualification for an inheritance that's not yours. And see, you, it all comes down to Esau didn't have to lose everything. He, all he had to do was be reconciled to Jacob and even receive the unfairness of the situation without a bitterness, which would have required him to accept grace, which is grace is not fair. It's not fair that he's not the heir. Jacob swindled that out of me. Yeah, but God's decree is that he has the blessing. And that's how we have to receive Christ. This is God's decree. Whether it's right or wrong, whether I understand it or not, it's God's word and I believe it or not. You know, if I curse him, I'm cursed. If I bless him, I'm blessed. He's been given the name. He's been given the birthright. If I want to enjoy anything related to the birthright, I have to enjoy Christ. I have to be reconciled to him. So it's hard to be reconciled to him and enjoy him while you're counting his blood an unclean thing, trotting him underfoot, insulting the spirit of grace, putting him to open shame, crucifying him fresh by going back to the temple and saying, well, actually, if I could just get the guilties off and get the people to stop accusing me. If they could see me in line with the turtle dove, then they would know I'm legitimate, and then I won't feel like this anymore. I don't care what Christ says. I'm more in favor of the immediate, my appetite for men's approval is driving me here. That is fornication. Um, spiritual fornication. You're going to some other husband to give you what only Christ gives you. Whether it's peer pressure, whether it's the approval of men, whether it's the law, whether it's anything you do where you're going to go and provide for yourself uh, a sense that only the birthright can give you. You know, this. some people really mess up when they know it's time to leave the institutional church. They, they say, well, I'm waiting for the right moment. And then you talk to them, why are you waiting? What are you waiting for? Well, I want to have a meeting with the pastor so I can get closure so we don't go on bad terms. Okay. You now, what happens is that they eventually lose their will to go. They have a conversation with the pastor. They get all turned upside down in their conscience and they go, what was I thinking? You know, um, now they're back in religion and they don't enjoy Christ and they don't even know what they, they're like. I don't know what I was thinking. I'm miserable. But last time I talked to the pastor about leaving, I felt like such a defiled sinner at the end of the conversation. Why? Because he manipulated you and told you about all your secret faults and told you that's the reason you want to leave. Then you listened to him and lost all your clarity. 
it's so it's hard to watch um but what is that that is seeking to justify your own conscience don't look for closure and that was the temptation and the persecution that was also the nature of god's discipline look are you going to give in to all this persecution and and go to the temple in order to offer a sacrifice just to get them to stop persecuting and accusing you so that you'll feel better rather than by faith uh, being outside the camp with Jesus who sanctified you with his own blood outside the gate and why don't you just bear his reproach that's what we're told to do in Hebrews so that's the context for he for uh, Esau and I don't think I explained it very well there's a lot more I could say but I have a bunch of things I need to do so hopefully you get the idea. Go back and read it, okay? Read what he's talking about from chapter 4 all the way to 13. It's all one conversation. It is entering the rest of God today while it is called today. Do not harden your heart. Uh, enter the rest. Come forward by faith in the blood. Enjoy what is yours in Christ, the heir and that's how Hebrews starts, right? He's the heir of all things. And he sat down at the right hand after he purged our sins. Everything is his now. He's the heir. He's the one with the birthright. It's not your birthright. But if you're going to enjoy it, you have to be reconciled to him. And you're not going to be reconciled to him while you're satisfying your conscience with other means. The only way to be reconciled to Christ is to satisfy your conscience by faith in the blood. That's the key. And it's by faith in the blood that we come forward and we enjoy our union with him. And there is the place of blessing and rest. Okay, and to be like Esau is to reject the present tense rest in Christ or the prof promised rest of Christ. Even sometimes we have to wait with patience for it. We don't get the satisfying feeling, but I'm still not going back to the church. I'm still not going back to temple. I'm still not going to offer something. Let them accuse me. I'm not going to try to vindicate myself. I'm waiting on Christ. Even if, though it looks like I'm miserable, I'll wait on him. Just plain obedience to the word. Um, okay, so that is obedience versus disobedience in Hebrews. Once you understand what Hebrews is about, you don't have to, you can suddenly see it's not talking about my salvation. It's talking about, do I enjoy the rest of Christ? Do I follow that by faith or do I go try to satisfy my conscience in religion? Um, okay, got to get going. I'll talk to you soon.